Making headlines tonight, Prime Minister Mia Amor Motley makes an impassioned plea for world leaders to seriously address climate change. New fishing regulations are coming. The man just chosen to head the BTMI Cops, a prestigious award. And coming up in sports, England maintain its 100% record at the T20 World Cup. Broadcasting from our studios in the Pine St. Michael, this is CBC News Night, starting now. I'm Shane Jones, leading the news at 7. Prime Minister Mia Amor Motley delivered a stinging rebuke to world leaders as she highlighted the need for urgent action to address the climate crisis. Prime Minister Motley was delivering a short address in Glasgow during the opening ceremony of the World Leaders Summit, taking place as part of the United Nations Climate Change Conference, better known as COP26. It was a message that resonated across the globe with major media houses including CNN, the BBC and Al Jazeera using extracts and secret her out for interviews. Sharika Griffith reports on the Prime Minister's address. Charging that climate finance to small island developing states declined by 25% in 2019, Prime Minister Mia Amor Motley told world leaders their failure to provide critical financing is both immoral and unjust. She says even with increased mitigation commitments by countries, the world is still likely to see a two degree rise in temperatures. 1.5 is what we need to survive. Two degrees, yes, SG, is a death sentence for the people of Antigua and Barbuda, for the people of the Maldives, for the people of Dominica and Fiji, for the people of Kenya and Mozambique, and yes, for the people of Samoa and Barbados. We do not want that dreaded death sentence. And we've come here today to say, try harder, try harder. Because our people, the climate army, the world, the planet, needs our actions now, not next year, not in the next decade. Prime Minister Motley says in the past 13 years, the central banks of some of the wealthiest countries invested trillions of dollars to increase their supply of money. She believes these funds could have been put to better use. Had we used that $25 trillion to purchase bonds, to finance the energy transition, or the transition of how we eat, or how we move ourselves in transport, we would now today be reaching that 1.5 degrees limit that is so vital to us. I say to you today in Glasgow that an annual increase in the SDRs of $500 billion a year for 20 years put in a trust to finance the transition is the real gap, Secretary General, that we need to close, not the 50 billion being proposed for adaptation. And if 500 billion songs big to you, guess what? It is just 2% of the 25 trillion. Stressing that leaders must not fail those who elect them, the Prime Minister says the pandemic has taught the world that national solutions to global problems do not work. Sharika Griffith, CBC News. Thanks, Sharika. More than 120 world leaders are in Glasgow, setting the tone for two weeks of negotiations they hope will produce a global plan to address the climate crisis. CNN's Isabel Rosales reports on President Biden's new plan, he says, places the United States as a world leader in fighting the climate crisis, all as scientists keep a close watch. Experts say COP26 may be the world's last best chance to address the climate crisis. That desperate hope is why the world is looking to you. A report published by the UN in August called a code red for humanity, showing the world is warming faster than previously thought. We are digging our own graves. Enough of treating nature like a toilet. Enough of burning and drilling and mining our way deeper. Despite leaders from China and Russia skipping the conference, negotiations will proceed with a goal to produce a plan to rapidly decarbonize the planet. If we fail, they will not forgive us. But there is skepticism of promises versus action. Six G20 countries, including the U.S., 
never met their targets to cut greenhouse emissions under the 2015 Paris Agreement. President Joe Biden vowing the U.S. will lead the world. Let this be the moment that we answer history's call. The White House set to launch a long-term climate strategy to get to net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. As Biden touts climate change measures and his ambitious legislative agenda currently inching forward on Capitol Hill. My administration is working overtime to show that our climate commitment is action, not words. Heir to the British throne, Prince Charles says the scale and scope of the threat we face call for a global solution based on radically transforming fossil fuel based economies to ones that are genuinely renewable and sustainable. He made a plea for countries to come together to create the environment that enables every sector of industry to take the action required. We know this will take trillions, not billions of dollars. We also know that countries, many of whom are burdened by growing levels of debt, simply cannot afford to go green. Here we need a vast military-style campaign to marshal the strength of the global private sector. With trillions at its disposal, far beyond global GDP, and with the greatest respect, beyond even the governments of the world's leaders, it offers the only real prospect of achieving fundamental economic transition. And we'll have more on COP26 right after this newscast on News Extra. The National Botanical Gardens program has been preempted. As world leaders gather in Glasgow to advocate for climate reform at COP26, dendrologist and director of the National Botanical Gardens, Nigel Jones, has made a call for Barbadians to plant more trees. While thousands of trees have already been planted across the island, Mr. Jones called for a widespread participation from individuals and organizations to help Barbados reach the million trees target. Our remit really is to plant one million trees around Barbados. We have gone up in the hundreds of thousands already. Um, I don't have the figure at hand, but we are moving, well, even despite or in spite of the COVID environment, we are getting there and even though it's an uphill task we are still struggling to reach that destination he made these remarks as members of the lions club of barbados planted a soursop tree in the national botanical gardens as part of their protecting our planet project 60b district governor lion claudio Buncamper spoke to the timelines of the exercise the environment is a very important aspect and around the world right now actually the G20 are meeting discussing the environment which as we know protecting our environment is a must and as lions it's one of our core areas and I'm very pleased and proud to be here today with my fellow lions and leos of Barbados in helping and doing our part in the society of Barbados by planting a sour sap tree at the botanical gardens. The COVID-19 death toll now stands at 156. A 70-year-old Barbadian man who was isolated at the Queen's College facility died yesterday afternoon. He was unvaccinated. Health and Wellness Minister Lieutenant Colonel Geoffrey Bostick has extended condolences to his family and friends. Barbados recorded 260 new COVID-19 cases from the 1,293 tests conducted by the Best of Santos Public Health Lab yesterday. The new positives comprise 131 males and 129 females and 61 people who are under the age of 18. There are 803 people in isolation facilities and 5,755 in home isolation. Now, even though a number of AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccines expired yesterday, there are still many more that are viable. Co-coordinator of the National Vaccine Unit, Dr. Elizabeth Ferdinand, told CBC News she still has to meet to find out exactly how many vaccines have to be discarded. However, she gave the assurance that AstraZeneca is still an option for Barbadians. I just want to, to let people know that yes, we have plenty more AstraZeneca that is not expiring until the end of December, so that if you have and you want a booster, you can come up and get it. But please remember that you must have waited six months since your last dose. 
So you have your first dose, you have your second dose, and then you wait six months before you have your booster. I want the first people, the first doses to come up, please, and come back for your seconds. The bright, beautiful lights are now officially on to signal the start of Barbados' independent celebrations. Community Empowerment Minister Dwight Sutherland says despite the many challenges that continue to face the island, recognizing our culture and heritage reminds us of the many blessings that we have to be thankful for. Minister Sutherland made the comments just before flipping the switch to officially launch this year's independent celebrations in the car park of the CBC here in the Pine with a Sajikor Independence Lighting Ceremony. This year's ceremony was mostly held virtually and showcased a number of performances, some of them from over the years. Minister Sutherland says the lights signify the hope and blessings of the nation. These lights should also be seen as the epitome of our independence, inspiring us to fight against ignorance, crime, unemployment, conflicts, divisions, disease, corruption, injustice, and inequality and the various problems that confront our people, both individually and collectively. Let us therefore grab each opportunity to promote the positive. And whilst we will not bury our heads in the sand, I'm advocating that we convert negatives into opportunities for learning and towards the growth and development of our people and our country. Minister Sutherland also used the opportunity to laud the efforts of the parish independence committees over the years. He also thanked sponsor Sajakor Life for its continued commitment and support of the lighting ceremony. He also said his ministry is committed to continuously fulfilling its mandate of developing and building the island's communities. He urged Barbadians to continue to play their part as well. I encourage all citizens to be the embodiment of our theme by celebrating our communities, our culture, and our people. Let us view this illumination of the island as a symbol that we must also let our inner light shine through the darkness and the trials which will come our way through life. Moreover, as we transition to Republican status, we need to be aware of our nationality, identity, and inspire pride in our culture if as a people we do not know who we are, then we tend to adopt other cultures and lose the essence of what it means to be Barbadian. New fishing regulations will soon be implemented. As Crystal Hoyt reports, they were announced by Minister of Maritime Affairs and the Blue Economy, Kirk Humphrey, at the reopening of the Paynes Bay Fish Market. After extensive consultation with stakeholders and fisherfolk, the government has approved new fishing regulations focusing on livelihoods and sustainability. In this market, you may not know, but the, the counters were extremely high. Those who were here will tell you. In some cases, people had to stand on buckets or crates to be able to, to play their trade. And so we've lowered the counters on all of the, the markets, especially here in this one. We've used a material that allows us to meet international phytosanitary standards, which is a commercial quartz. We've renovated the bathrooms. We've added a bathroom for the fishermen over there. We've also made sure that there is wheelchair access here because all the markets must be disabled friendly. And the area on which you stand or sit, some of you, is paved to be allowed to allow people to, to gather here, but more primarily for the fishermen to be able to haul out their vessels. Minister Humphrey was speaking at the reopening of the fish market in Paynes Bay, which has been renovated. Joined by MP for the area, Kerry Simmons, he said addressing the key issues fisher folk face at this market was important. We had a meeting with the Senate fishers and we agreed that once these regulations are put into law, we will allow net fishing for persons who are cashing jacks but that we will not allow say, net fishing for chubbing. And people who are in the industry understand that fully. The fish that are under threat are the chubs. The other thing that we've also agreed upon in these new regulations is that we will allow pot fishing. Many people again have asked me to ban all kinds of pot fishing as if people don't have to eat in Barbados. And so we've said no, we will allow pot fishing, but that the pot fishermen now have to be registered with the ministry We've also put in these regulations because some fishermen have complained for others 
that you cannot trouble somebody else's pot. That now becomes illegal. Fish vendor Melissa Tate said she was happy for the upgrades and welcomed the policy changes. I think our industry is going through a metamorphosis. And people do not want to realize and recognize that the operations of our industry from beforehand cannot carry us or propel us into the 21st century. Now the Fisher Four is filled with many persons who've been there for years. So they want to maintain what they know. At present, I've been monitoring it and our fish stock is not as plentiful as it used to be. We could blame it on climate change, but we also have to be knowledgeable of some of our practices. Tate said fisher folk must preserve the industry for future generations. Crystal Hoyt, CBC News. Thanks, Crystal. The buzz about Barbados in international tourism circles continues, with the man just chosen to lead the island's marketing drive copping a prestigious award. Kent Gerson has that story. On the day he officially took up duties as the CEO of the BTMI, Jens Trainhart has brought even more of the international spotlight to Barbados. He's been selected as one of the recipients of the Tourism Heroes Award for 2021. The presentation was made at the World Travel Market in London. He has been in, involved in Mekong tourism for many years and just today started a new position as the CEO of the Barbados Tourism Board. And he's not only here alone, he brings his minister, the Honorable Lisa Cummins, um, with, with him and the Director of Tourism. So he's here in full force, waving the Barbados flag. Congratulations. I was in Beijing, it's a good thing. and then I was in Bangkok, and Barbados was the natural choice. So uh, I'm very honored, I'm excited to be in Barbados. A contingent representing Barbados, led by Tourism Minister Senator Lisa Cummings, and BTMI Chairman Roseanne Myers, is attending the World Travel Market. Ms. Mars has been telling CBC about the significance of the award and its relevance to Barbados. The World Tourism Network awards someone who has been nominated and chosen from a panel to be someone who represents um, all that is good about tourism and someone who has shown certainly throughout COVID um, that it is required for us to keep our shoulder to the wheel. Mr. Trainhart was recognized for the work he's done on building resilience among small businesses in his previous um, job, in his previous destination, but building resilience among community tourism uh, participants in the tourism sector, which is very, very relevant to what we also need to do in Barbados. Train Hart, a 26-year veteran in the hospitality industry, is expected to leverage his experience and industry contacts to take Barbados's tourism brand to new heights. Kent Gerson, CBC News. Thanks, Kent. Despite the current surge in COVID-19 cases, the 9 o'clock curfew and other restrictions, Barbados will still see a strong return of visitors from the U.S. and Canada this winter tourist season. That's the assessment from directors of the Barbados Tourism Marketing, Inc. Speaking last evening on the People's Business, BTMI director for the U.S., UC Skeet, said there has been a vote of confidence from airline partners and travelers. And we are seeing people looking at advance for the winter season, which is showing us that it's going to be a strong winter. But there's also a significant amount of persons who are making those last minute decisions. There's a much shorter looking winter now as well. So I think the efforts that we've been doing here on the ground to make sure that we're positioning Barbados in the right way, to make sure that Barbados becomes that choice for customers, I think that will also ensure that there is continuous uh, demand for the destination that even if there are some cancellations that we have done the work to make sure that those persons were making the last minute decisions that they choose Barbados. Lawmen are seeking the public's assistance in locating a missing man. He is Edwin Ernest Herbert, also known as Tallboy, aged 60 years of Colorado Rock, St. Michael. Herbert is about 6 feet 3 inches tall of dark complexion with an oval face, small ears and eyes with a full nose and medium lips. 
He was last seen leaving the compound of Corbin's garage about a quarter past four on Friday afternoon, traveling the direction of the city. At the time, he was wearing a blue shirt with the logo of Corbin's garage and long khaki pants. Anyone who has information regarding his whereabouts is asked to contact Police Emergency at 211, Crime Stoppers at 1-800-TIPS, or the District A Police Station or any police station. Sports time now. We head over to the sports studio and say very good evening to Damien Best. Well, West Indies are now working on the mathematical equation of net run rate at the ICC T20 World Cup. That's the opinion of cricket analyst Pedro Igar speaking on the latest edition of TV8's World Cup wrap-up show. Igar says although recent results from other matches have favored the Windies, the regional side's fate can very well come down to net run rate. USA will find themselves in a situation where they need to beat Sri Lanka. I mean, that, that's not a, 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 a given. But that final game against Australia, the real, real world West Indies team will need to come up because they will need to win and win with a superior net run rate to whoever those final opponents are. Now, let's look at Australia, who they'll be playing. Australia are showing that they are a team that are likely to have a low scoring game. They, they chased down 118 against South Africa, finished at 121 in 19.4 overs, which meant they, they went tight. Now today, they scored 125, so they're a team you can restrict. So again, a good weekend for West Indies. They have it all in their hands, but you know, you'll see how, they, how it goes. One man who knows the pressures of the game is reminding the defending champions that a lot is depending on them. Former Wendy's all-rounder Ian Bradshaw says even if their previous losses uh, return to haunt them, they should at least go down fighting. Australia had a very heavy defeat. Um, will they be defeated by Bangladesh to any significant extent? Uh, I, I, I doubt that. Um, so we, we're going to be challenged to make up room. But it's going to be important that we don't leave it too much for the last game. The game against Sri Lanka, we, we, we've got to set it up. We've got to be convincing. And... and Always remember that you represent the people of the West Indies, you're defending champions, and, and let that be your foremost goal. So I expect two strong games. If, if we do get through, that, that's great. But if we don't get through, let, let's go out showing the world um, that West Indies cricket still has something to build on going into the next World Cup. The Business Report is brought to you by Sky Mall, serving you to make your shopping experience pleasurable. Climate change will have an impact on agriculture. That's among the findings of finance expert and designated head of the soon-to-be-established Green Bank, Dr. Avinash Prasad. He was giving his views on the sector in light of COP26. The finance expert told the business report that mechanization will also be a factor for local agriculture. There's been a lot of mechanization in agriculture, even in sugarcane. Uh, the big um, uh, machines that cut the cane uh, need flat land. Brazil has become such a major produ producer of sugar uh, because they can use these machines. So that was one of the reasons why we became less able to compete. But, and then we began importing cheap food. And it's good that people could import cheap food because people in low incomes need access to, good, to cheap food. But the problem is we're importing bad cheap food and we need to grow good food. Satisfaction for some, concern for others. The reactions from sections of the tourism industry as luxury cruise liners return and new air carriers head to Barbados in the run-up to the start of the winter tourist season. Trevor Thorpe reports. But the real gap here is a financing gap. There's no point everyone pledging. Uh, on the beach for some water sport operators. That's the word from veteran water sport operator Charles Penny Pilgrim of Charles Water Sport at Dover Beach Christchurch. He says the tourists are going to the all-inclusive hotels. Pilgrim was responding to comments of a bright winter tourist season in the wake of the return of luxury cruise liners and new air carriers to Barbados. Like we have a nice group, a uh, water sport fraternity group, that we even have to get together and actually tackle that from that point of view. But I think that from a one-on-one -on -one point uh, person, it's very difficult to get to the Ministry of Tourism to explain our problem we have not having tourists on this beach so far. Pilgrim says he is still waiting to see movement and he is not excited about the coming winter season. I for sure, from a water sports uh, perspective, I haven't seen 
a turnaround yet. I see more local people on weekends, Saturdays and Sundays, than I see tourists. On weekdays, we hardly see anybody on these beaches. And if you have a look at the beach, you see the hardly see people on the beach. And this is Sunday. So I don't know what's going to happen or when it's going to turn around. I sincerely hope it happens soon. Down at Needham's Point, the mood was very different. As scuba instructor Caria Bloom at Barbados Blue explains. It's been pretty good. I can't complain too much. We've had, um, you know, divers most days. We're, we're pretty busy right now. I think we're quite lucky that we get to train in the Hilton pool, so we get a nice experience that way and a lot of exposure through the Hilton and the other hotels that are starting to get busier as well. Trevor Thorpe, CBC News. Time to check back in with Damien in the sports studio for the second half in sports. Thanks, Shane. Well, talented Barbadian boxer Jabali Brady says there is no holding back when he competes tomorrow in the quarterfinals at the Aiba Men's World Boxing Championships in Belgrade, Serbia. B Jabali has a shot at a semifinal spot after winning both his opening uh, round matchups in the under 54 kilogram category. He's now just one win away from a guaranteed medal, but first has to beat Tomoya Tosobi of Japan. Brady tells CBC Sports preparations for the boat are going well, and he's been putting in the extra work. I want to give a good thanks to God, my family, all my supporters in Barbados that supported me right through. You know what I mean? My team and everyone. Um, my first fight, um, I had a good game plan. Um, my game plan was to um, make my opponent on the back foot all the time. I pressure him and I, I get it done and I get the W, get the win. And my second fight was a pretty tough fight. My game plan was to box him and then pressure him and, and I succeed with it and I get the the next win and this time is now I stick into my first game plan to win this next fight and I just want everybody just tune in because this one will make history for Barbados this one the whole of Barbados tune in for this one tomorrow we'll be working for my focus is like more attacking let's work body head body head you know what I mean left right body head movement head you know what I mean Got you covered. Finally, West Indies Women League selector Ambrong John says it's a pleasure to have the services of the senior players for the upcoming tour of Pakistan. Wendy's Women Captain Stephanie Taylor and Shemaine Campbell have been included in the 15-member squad for the upcoming three-match ODI series and the ICC Women's Cricket World Cup qualifier in Zimbabwe. Campbell had missed the home series against Pakistan women and South Africa women due to injury, while Taylor was unavailable for the recent series against South Africa in Antigua with COVID-related issues. Taylor is expected to strengthen both the batting and bowling department, while wicketkeeper batter Campbell impressed electors in the lone practice match before departure by scoring a century. It's very, very important having Shemaine back because it's not only her batting, she's an experienced batter, but remember she was also the our first string wicket keeper. So although we have had wicket keepers, they have done their job while Shemaine has away, has been away. Shemaine's return now also strengthens the wicket keeping department and the batting department. And now that she has come back, she has played very good in these scenarios we have had. And then she scored a century in the match. So we are quite confident that um, Sherman's return will strengthen the team exceedingly. Well, the lead selector also highlighted how important the next few months of cricket are for the Wendy's women. There will be two things I would think that we are looking for. One, we defeated Pakistan in the series at home, and we will hope to do that again. And if we do that, it will be a positive going into the qualifier where Pakistan is one of the teams that would also be hoping to qualify. So it should give us a bit of confidence when we have to play against Pakistan. And it is always, always great having a series win before you go into a, a qualifier. So it will give the players a bit more confidence. So going to Pakistan, we are looking for continued improving performances and to win the series. Well, the squad which has already arrived in Pakistan reads Captain Stephanie Taylor, Vice Captain Niza Mohammed, Alia Alin, Shimin Campbell, Shamilia Connell, DeAndre Dotton, Shanita Grimon, Chanel Henry, uh, Kiana Joseph, Kaisia Knight, Kaishana Knight, Haley Matthews, Chidea Nation, Shakira Salman, and Rashida Williams. Shane, that is sports tonight. Back over to you.
Uh, this before we go, remember earlier in the news we told you about that missing man. Well, there's been new developments to that story. Mr. Edwin Herbert, also known as Tallboy, has been traced by police alive at Bishop's Court Hill, St. Michael. He was reported missing on Sunday, October 31st by a family member. That's our news. Good night and be good. Thanks for visiting us. To get more stories like this one, like and subscribe to our YouTube channel.